questions have been coming through, some about the generational responses, some about communication on there. So if you have further questions, please post them in the comment section. And what I will do is respond to them live right now. And you know, if there's a ton of questions, great, we'll get to all of them. We have time uh, available. If not, no worries. Um, and with that said, I hope everyone's uh, safe at the moment. I know we're in a crazy time right now. I'm actually here in uh, Revere, Massachusetts, uh, streaming from my small office in uh, my apartment. So let's take a look at some of these questions that have come through here. Um, let's start off with the um, generational question in terms of the pandemic. This one can go pretty far in terms of uh, responses on here because this does affect everyone. This was one of the first questions that came in here from Joe. And it's, the question is, do you see different generational responses to the current pandemic? If so, how uh, should the courts address those concerns with employees? This one is fascinating to me. In fact, I spent a lot of time recently looking at uh, politics uh, in terms of and capitalism and uh, different groups in sociology recently because I was very surprised by what was taking place. Uh, when you have a like groups of individuals who have differences, in order to unite those differences, you usually have to have a say a common foe, enemy, or belief idea, etc. Something to unify the force. And with the pandemic, which uh, what a lot of people hypothesized in the very beginning of the pandemic is that it would actually bring people together collectively. And people would be like, hey, we can put aside our differences and work together more effectively. That actually, from a political standpoint, back did the opposite, which is fascinating to me on why that took place. Now, from a generational perspective, I've seen things all across the board on here, and I don't think you can really bucket into generational groups on here. And in fact, I can't even speak for the millennial generation on this because there's myself, which I would say is more leans on the side of, I go out every day with a mask. Um, I spray things down when I go down in public, especially because I'm in Massachusetts, so we're doing pretty good in terms of the pandemic right now. So we have gyms that are open. I'll spray things down the gym, but then you have the reverse side, which is, generational groups or people in my same generation who would go and say host um what are they called um immune parties basically herd immunity parties where they would try and get coronavirus in order to build the herd immunity on there so you see several different angles on there um in terms of how that actually affects the workplace and the perspectives that are there i think you have to fall back on Adam's equity theory here and whatever you choose, you have to go forward with that and make sure that it's pretty egalitarian across the board on there. Um, I know certain places or working environments in LA, which is right now the hardest hit county in the entire United States, where they have people in offices who do not have masks, who do not social distance, and no one in the office has gotten COVID. Now, could that change? Of course. Um, but I think that since the leadership team, what they um, are moving forward with, and everyone in the environment is also on the same page, that will work for that particular environment. Now, that's needless to say of what should be done on the larger spectrum, but I'm saying treat it as a micro spectrum and more just say, hey, what are people comfortable with? What is the most reasonable circumstance of what we have here? Um, in the courts, I know a lot of people have to be in person on there, so it makes things a lot more difficult versus, versus say, my work, which is a lot more remote on there. So in that case, I would say treat it as its unique unit, make sure leadership's on board and make sure it's equal across the entire organization on there. That's how I address it with employees. So that's for the first question. Uh, next question that we have on here is, um, you mentioned communication tone is a very important to a cohesive group. Are there any suggestions you may have for a total lack of communication or poor communication in the workplace? Are there any ways to make sure that we have truly reached, reached any di the different generations and how to make certain they're heard. Yeah, this is basically asking in terms of communication, how do we reach a point where everyone feels like it's psychologically uh, safe to bring forward those ideas to create, say, the pipelines of innovation in an organization? This, unfortunately, from an individual perspective, comes down to the individuals on there. It's very easy to point out a system and say, well, uh, the system that we have, uh, or you know, the organization that we have is corrupt, but it's like actually it comes down to the individual uh, people who are there. And this is very much things that are 
authentic to the individual. So if we have a manager who's communicating with someone, that individual, how they address that individual, if they mirror it to a, the same way they would mirror, say, a friend and how comfortable their friends feel uh, opening and expressing themselves, those common traits are the same on there. So the, the question then going into, if you have a total lack of poor communication, I would say define that more specifically because communication being poor can arise in many different forms. You can have manager to manager that's poor. You can have manager to subordinate. You can have entire departments that don't communicate well with other departments. And I've seen this a lot in organizations where two of them are doing the same thing and it creates, it costs an organization more money because they're, they're fighting a lot better. In the uh, court system, if you're a leader in the court system and to really analyze how people feel in terms of communication and making sure that each individual is heard on there, I would more sit back and watch and see how people work with each other and be a fly on the wall in meetings and say, okay, who's willing to offer ideas verbally? If they're extroverted, it might be a lot easier for them to mention verbally, but maybe behind the scenes, let's say in a one-on-one -on -one meeting, an introvert would be more likely to talk on there, right? Look to see if there's anyone that's not really engaging on that front and then dig into, is this a result of promote communication or how, is there, how do they actually um, feel in terms of the actual side of that? Because as an introvert, What's really weird is I go and I speak and I get keynotes, but the, the thing is, is I have a very hard time speaking in groups because I don't feel that in a group manner that I have heard enough everyone's ideas in order to get my own forward there. So I would be cautious on that front in terms of making the judgment that if someone's not talking, it's bad communication. I would more say in an individual one-on-one -on -one perspective, are people willing to offer their ideas on there as well? So I would look at those two different ways. It's hard to... Um, Give us all an answer on that because poor communication can manifest itself in so many ways on there. Uh, next question. How can we work around filtered content or to bring a bigger picture of what's available when doing searches and gathering information? Uh, Terry, your answer is DuckDuckGo. Um, they are pretty good in terms of not tracking your information and they are a search engine that is able to give, uh, well, won't track your results on there. So I, I suggest if you're using Chrome, Firefox, uh, Internet Explorer, or Safari, check out DuckDuckGo on there. Um, so I would go with that front. <laughs> um, in the court system, we encounter a diverse group of people from a variety of countries. Are there generational generations and their stereotypes consistent around the world? No, it's a lot different. Um, I know this specifically because I have different uh, generations one and different cultures and countries <laughs> in my organization and I'm telling you it's it's a lot different um, one of the things that I had on a previous presentation was a study done by Harvard and it looked at the confrontational side and more laid-back certain cultures were in a working environment and you would see you could type it um, I forget what the actual study that they did, but if you type in Harvard Business Review and you talk, type in generations and their ability to be working together, it's all across the board on there. And there are commonalities in generations where you would have, let's say, younger individuals tend to be, let's say, more optimistic about the world and may all have, don't know what they don't know. That's universal. That's normal psychology on there. And people who are older tend to be more conservative because they've realized, hey, there's a lot of things in life that can threaten me from some standpoint. So it tends to shift in that perspective on there. Um, in terms of the actual um, culture and team and how to go forward with that, um, there are stereotypes, um, of course, um, but I do not, I have not found them to be very consistent on there. Uh, one thing I ran into specifically was in my internal team, and I talk a lot about communication, making sure that people feel um, heard and also are willing to offer their ideas as pipelines of innovation. And what I found, which was fascinating, is that I have employees who've worked with me virtually for over three years. That's a long time, especially in the virtual world, where I've only met them once in person, okay? That's very uniquely virtual. And with all the trust, never cracking, never like freaking out and <laughs> going crazy as uh, the, the leader on the team, I would sometimes have um, an idea would come up or they would say something and I would respond, but then they, would, they wouldn't they would offer their opinion 
from there. And it turns out culturally, in terms of a subordinate to manager, they're not supposed to respond. So they shut down. And I would often ask the team, hey, does anyone have any questions? And after the meeting would end, they would all talk to the manager on the team instead of me. And I was like, always asking the manager, why are they doing that? Why, why can't they just ask me? Because I'm like, how many questions? And a lot of it's cultural on there. And with different cultures, a lot of it is being patient, but also having the standpoint of like, hey, you know what? I don't know here. And having the intentions of wanting to learn and being able to work with people on there. So I say with different cultures, it is a case by case situation. And as long as you, the people can see your intentions are solid and you're willing to be patient on there, you can work across different cultures and different generations across there. Um, what are some key points in developing a performance improvement plan for millennials? Okay, uh, one is quantitative, right? You need to be very clear on what is the problem and what are the quantitative black and white things that need to change on there. Uh, I had someone recently who is, um, I guess, a millennial, so my same generation, and I they were underperforming dramatically. And so we, we broke it down where they, they would do, it's very systematic what they do on there, but for the sake of this conversation, um, I will offer the these activity levels so anyone can see how this breaks down. So essentially, they were supposed to do a certain number of activities, so they make a certain number of calls each day. And their results weren't that good. So I said, okay, first off is meeting the right of calls, quantitative, as performance plan, right? Because the we want to improve their end result, which isn't there. Then once they got the performance plan there and they were able to hit the activity levels, we said, okay, now that you're able to hit the right activity levels, it's improving your technique on that. Once we improve their technique on that front, and we set a performance plan also for the quantitative standpoint, but also on a deadline, right? So if it's not by this point, here's a repercussion on there. Once we hit the coaching, they were able to improve and far exceed our expectations. So the first thing is quantitative. Find something black, quantitative, black and white. Two, and a deadline. Three, getting buy-in. Having complete transparency, sitting them down. Hey, here's what's happening. Here's what we're going to do. And it needs to be done by this date. With that, you will find a very interesting reaction. Uh, it can go two different ways. The one way is that they buy in. They work with you really, uh, work with you all the way. And chances are they improve from there because you're with them the whole process. The other is that they fire themselves. And I've seen this where I've met with employees and I said, look, here's the mark. You need to do this, which is something that's in their control. And if you're not able to meet this mark, you're no longer on the team. And before the, the deadline, they fired themselves. They said, I'm not going to be here anymore. Easier for me. But if we don't actually set those boundaries and have that clear communi communication, no one's on the same page on there. So that's how I do a performance plan. I'm not saying it's millennial specific on there. I think that's just universally how you put together performance plan on a high macro level perspective. Of course, it changes for positions, et cetera. Um, how do we focus on incentivizing different generations in the workplace and how is this different in the pandemic and teleworking? Okay, so yeah, that's, that's a hard question because each individual organization, individual is incentivized by different things because some people are incentivized to work because of security, right? Because their uh, daughter is at home and they they're want to make sure that their spouse is taken care of as well. So they would work in order to maintain that sense of security on there. Um, you will have, I don't think, well, okay, from a generational standpoint, here's the overarching, uh, more of a social, social uh, psychology perspective. When people become older, right, from high school, they tend to have more and more responsibilities, right? Family, kids, they're more um, overall responsibilities, which means that their sense of wanting to take risk declines on there. That's pretty universal on there. For younger generations on there, in terms of the incentivization patterns, it, it depends on how you're currently incentivizing them because the way I, I see this question is that there might be an issue of people feeling engaged and then how to have people engaged while working in the pandemic and telework on there. And I'm guessing um, the, the person who asked it is TJ from Georgia, uh, Georgia is that maybe the forced workforce that he's in is actually declining engagement. 
on there. So then if that's the case, I would look at more of the performance plan of what's required of the people around you. Then from there, looking at how clearly are you mapping or you're vocalizing those expectations on there, and then how are you measuring those expectations in the group itself? Once you have those more clear, you will be able to have, people will be able to see that clear transparency and be able to act accordingly as though it was in person in there. Now, here's the curveball for everyone here. The pandemic stuff, and I know a lot of people online are like, oh, it's tough and difficult. It's depressing. Like it's in ways that I could not have imagined. I'm sure there's ways that you haven't uh, couldn't imagine because in the beginning I thought it was just, oh, you can't go to the movies. You might not be able to work out as uh, with people or you might not be able to, let's say, go to a theme park, but you know, we can wear a mask and stuff. But the amount of human contact that's hitting people does create a overarching sense of depression on there. And I've seen this with a lot of my own family, friends, and you can probably see a lot of frustration in the nation at large. And I would say having one-on-ones -on -one and check-ins with people to make sure like how they're doing psychologically if you're a leader in that situation is really important on there. And just saying, hey, how's, how are your family doing? How are you doing? Just chatting. So that's how I would um, handle that. Um, no, okay, so Kate, Kenneth, Kenneth, sorry, <laughs> asks from uh, a question about you've acknowledged the technological differences among generation. Has the pandemic, by forcing a greater use of certain technologies, improved or exacerbated generational differences in these technology communi communication technologies? Kenneth, uh, Kenneth, it's actually um, improved dramatically. I know this because my grandparents now know how to use Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> and since we have a higher level of expectation of people using technologies, those differences tend to more consolidate on there. And it's actually uh, a really good thing from that because it's not that people who are older aren't smart enough to use it. They're entirely capable of doing that. They just didn't have as much time using it as someone who's younger. Um, that's my overarching uh, opinion on that. So I've, I definitely think it's improved dramatically on there, wholeheartedly on that. Okay, that's another by Kenneth. Um, okay, so TJ, again, from uh, Georgia. So given our renewed national conversation on race and identity, how can we use generational differences to engage and add to the, this conversation? This is a tough one because the whole conversation about race and identity, it really, I try and avoid having politics in the workplace on this. And this can go totally different ways on there. And I, I you might have seen that the overarching perspective of my talk is like, hey, you know, we're different. Everyone's different and that's okay. And how do we as an organization or as a group work together effectively? And I, let's see, how can we use generational differences to engage and add to the conversation? It's the exact same way on there, in which I talked about the alignment, building the actual solid culture, and then having the communication to add to the innovation pipelines in an organization. The reason why I, I broke that down like that is that even though I talk about it from a generational perspective, it works from a cultural perspective, um, race perspective as well on there. It's because you're mapping things, that you're, you're providing a framework or people can be in an environment where they can vocalize their perspective and add value to the goals of the organization at whole, regardless of who's the background. <laughs> okay. And we have um, next one, Angie. Uh, do you have any suggestions for dealing with those who have different boundaries and may not respect the boundaries of others? Is there a good way to get the generations to communicate with each other effectively? Two major questions here. One is the, do we have different boundaries and may not respect each other's boundaries? Those are two very, very different problems because obviously people have different boundaries. You go to a different culture, they'll stand different distances from each other. <laughs> I went to Spain, I, I found out surprisingly that people have no problem kissing me on the cheeks and that was very uncomfortable <laughs> for the first bit be coming from the United States on there. Uh, it, culturally, it, there's always different in terms of either physical boundaries or emotional boundaries on that. And that's why I believe that for an organization at whole, having that alignment 
on there and really as a leader define what sort of level of boundaries do you set for people and this could be very qual uh, qualitative because you can have emotional boundaries where as a leader you might vocalize this is what's happening in my life and my wife says this and my daughter does that or you can have that more closed off on there as a leader and they still can work equally on there so as if for angie on that i would say first off figuring out where are the boundaries and like write them down. This is what someone else thinks. This is what the leaders are on this board and try and figure out something that can consistent work across the board. That's the first thing. The second thing is people who might not respect the boundaries of others. Yeah, that's, that could be a big problem on there. I've had employees who, um, I remember distinctively that I would have employees who would be very nice to me, but treat others poorly on there, be rude to them, say like awful things and Unfortunately, I didn't hear about it until it was three months later because the employees who were being um, on the bad end of that didn't want to tell me. They said, yeah, enough to worry about. We didn't want to vocalize it. But after a while, I started to see that shut down. And so there's a couple ways that I, I went about those boundaries. First off, I, I opened up dialogue with the individual, talked about here's my expectations as um, your supervisor. And here's where it's okay in this culture here are the guidelines here's what's not okay and you cross it over there if x happens again here's a repercussion on there sure enough he ended up leaving the organization within a few more weeks but that happened a few times in my organization where it was essentially people who were not being respectful to others and having to open up that conversation on a one-on-one -on -one perspective sometimes you can bring in both employees and talk it out between them if there's a conflict other times as a leader, uh, ultimately, in a way, you have to use the iron fist of like sitting down, hey, here's the expectations, you cross the boundary here, here's the repercussion on that. Um, is there a good way to get the generation on, generations to communicate with one another effectively? <laughs> That's like the entire, um, I mean, it depends on how you define good, Angie, right? Is there a good way to, to get the generations to communicate effectively with one another? I mean, uh, the whole presentation was around how to do that effectively. Um, I don't, yeah, I, I think a lot of it goes into what I talked about earlier in terms of the constant communication with each other, having the patience on there. And let's say, here's a classic example. Um, you have someone who's more seasoned, someone who's younger. And the more seasoned person who tends to be older, not as involved with technology, using massive stereotypes here to portray an example, might not be as, say, quick on Zoom as someone who's younger. How do you solve those differences? It's a two-way street. Old, the more seasoned individual at least has to be like, hey, I don't know this, and be, I need help. Younger individual has to be like, hey, this person for not knowing this doesn't make them inferior. It's just they need help and being able to work together cohesively. It's not just one person's right and one person's wrong. Both parties have to come to an agreement that this is something that's possible on there. So that's how I would approach that on there. Angie, if you want a follow-up question on that, please do uh, ask something on that in case I was not able to be as thorough as you would like on there. Uh, Jude asks from New Jersey, am I gonna play piano for you today? <laughs> she asked twice. Uh, my, I moved uh, two weeks ago, I said I don't have the Steinway uh, piano. If you ever went through my website, you would see I play piano and <laughs> I don't have it with me. And I would feel that if um, Jude, it would be just, it would be like a egotistical of me to say here in case you guys don't have questions on me play. So maybe another day, Jude. Um, Kelly says instead of relying on stereotypes, what is the best way to approach a conversation with each generation staff member to determine their motives, learning styles, and goals? I have encountered a staff that has uh, sensitive about their generation and the stereotypes associated with them. Yeah, Kelly, I, I think this is exactly what I covered in this presentation here is like sitting down and just asking. That sounds like too easy, but literally it is. Just actually knowing someone as an individual beyond their stereotype on there. And if you're an actual leader and ability to have that actual conversation and get to know the individual, this you don't need this a stereotype to effectively work with them. And that magically opens up the relationship because the person feels more hurt and they're saying, hey, these are my ways I work best in this environment on there. And Kelly, I don't know your 
uh, culture, your race, where you're from, but I can just see from here that it's it's a name from North Dakota. I don't know anything about you on there, but if I was going to sit down with you and let's say I was your supervisor and I worked with you, I would have a conversation like that. Just da 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 da. da. And you know what's crazy is that most people in management want to make it really complicated. And a lot of management and leading is not like that. You can make a lot of ground just by sitting down and having a conversation. And by hearing that out, people were like, okay, they're willing to see past my differences on there and they're willing to listen to me on there. That's when you open up and as a leader, you're able to understand what are the learning styles, what motivates them, and how can you and them work together effectively on there. I know it's not revolutionary, but I've done it. I've seen the research. I've seen a lot of people, best leaders, always are able to sit down and relate to someone on an individual level like that. Uh, John from the US, with more staff working remotely, how do we adjust to our communication style when we are chatting with remote staff primarily via text and only seeing them each other on Zoom occasionally? Good question, John. That's a tough one. Um, I've been working with remote teams since 2014 on there before COVID and all that. Here's a couple things to know on that. Yes, via chat is what's most commonly used on there. For this, John, a couple things are important. One is making sure that you have those difficult conversations over Zoom, okay, if you can't meet in person. Two is when you have one-on-ones, or at least make sure you have one-on-ones on there. Because what I find, even I make this mistake today or recently, um, if you think something's okay on chats, it's very easy to misread things. And sometimes if you're in a leadership position and you have someone who's subordinate, you could say something and it's misinterpreted entirely on the other end. And that can create a lot of unnecessary drama on there. So make sure you have those one-on-one -on -one check ins um, via video call on there. Um, communication style, just make sure that overall you're being more conscientious of what you actually say because you might be able to say, get away with, um, oh yeah, that's fine and um, like as a joke in the workplace. But if you have it over chat, um, people can misinterpret it entirely. <laughs> so you gotta be really careful on those things. Um, and that's not to get like super liberal about the workplace on that. It's more just, hey, um, it's like if you text someone randomly on versus on text, it's like, don't um, don't send something that's very ambiguous. Otherwise, they will send the worst. <laughs> so those are a couple of things that you can uh, do, John, on there. Angie, again, a bit of clarification. Our seasoned employees refuse to learn new technology and have a tight relationship with our millennials. Uh, they tend to bend together against Generation X. <laughs> wow, okay. Jeez, you got a whole system going here. Okay, which makes the environment more stressful. Not sure if it's a generational thing or just a click, but there's a lot of miscommunication and a bad feeling that comes out of it. Yeah, that's that's intense. Um, look, seasoned employees have to learn new tech, and if they at least want to be effective on the team in this environment, no question about it. Um, and it seems like those clicks are forming on there, which clicks naturally develop in organization. The question then is, how do you effectively um, deal with those individual clicks on there. So let's see, how would I actually work with that? It's way more difficult virtually, right? If you are virtually breaking up a click because it's really impossible on there and clicks will, will come, um, will develop. How would I break, how would I break that down? Um, First off, I would set the expectation that the people who are more seasoned have to learn it on there. They're, it's just a requirement on that. Do it, and that's that. Um, if people can be more specific on the pushback on that, I'll be interested in that, but it's ultimately having the repercussion if they don't learn it by a certain date on there. If they really have a tight relationship with the millennial employees, maybe the millennials can actually, who are might be better, stereotypically, I'm assuming, they're better with technology, can help them out. Um, I... Don't know how they band up against Generation X, but I don't like it when people band up against each other with the stressful environment. So the way I would break that down is by case by case, um, 
if you're able to see something that's actually physical, not physical, but just like, hey, um, let's say they're in a working environment and so-and-so does this to X, Y, and Z person that violates some sort of procedure, you set them down and say, hey, you crossed the boundary on there. There's a lot of gray area on here and the amount of control you can have is difficult on there because clicks are inevitable. I have clicks in my own company and they're all across the board on there. So I would definitely stay in strong with the expectation on there and look at it in a case-by-case -case situation on where those people are starting to create um, a, a poor culture from that perspective. And very often, Angie, what happens is that it's only one person who's causing this problem. Okay. Kari, um, other than volunteering outside of the workplace, do you have any other specific suggestions for promoting equality in the workplace where employees have several different levels of responsibility? Okay, there's like several things in here. So let's see. Oh, right, there's different levels of responsibility. So how do you actually um, are able, okay, so carry the whole idea behind the volunteering time off is putting people in an environment where the hierarchy that they're a part of is removed on there. So you can do things that involve extracting people outside of that organizational hierarchy in a domain where they have a common goal. For instance, uh, something that's common as escape rooms. I don't suggest you do it, but it's just an idea for like a fun team building activity on there. Um, a lot of teams use things like that, like fun games and activities like that, and, or maybe they take a hike together and they have to work together in order to get something done. Those are all different options, but anything that extracts people outside of the working environment is a way of removing that responsibility layer on there. Uh, last question for Kath Griffin in Michigan. As some employees are able to work remotely and others not, how do you deal with older employees who can cannot work remotely, understand that those who are actually working remotely are actually working not getting past the perception that they're just enjoying time at home? happens a lot. Um, this is the biggest fear of why all the organizations today haven't gone remote. And it wasn't until the pandemic they actually decided to is because it's the FaceTime theory is that if I can't see you working, you're not working. Here's how you do it. Um, if you have individuals who think that people working remotely are not working, it's very easy. You have what are their assignments and their deliverables when they were actually working in person. And if they're working remotely, you measure up against the same ones, plain and simple. And what you find is that some people can do it, some people cannot. And that ranges across all different organizations on there. And unfortunately, um, not all people are able to work remotely. As someone who's been running uh, organizations that are remote for six years, I can tell you some people can't hack it. And I know large organizations who laid off many people because they would just not do anything remotely. But uh, Catherine, the big thing is being able to tangibly measure what they were doing in person and then remotely. And if you can separate that, there's no question whether or not they're doing work on there. It's way more uh, transparent on there. All right. So with that said, I believe that's all the questions. I'm like all new to this dashboard, so I'm like looking through all this. Let's see. Um, yeah, great questions, guys. Um, but let's see. Yep. All right. So with that, oh, okay. Um, hold on a second. Let me um, send out because it's going a little bit longer than I thought it would. A few minutes late. Okay. So. Let's see, I'll answer a few more questions here. Let's see. Um, I think Jason can help out with whether or not the recording will be available and do it on there. Yes, okay, Valerie's got it. <laughs> Valerie's on it. Um, okay, seasoned employees should be given directed to learn. Okay, yeah. Uh, Pan has a great comment here. Seasoned employees should be given directive to learn technology and leadership's expectations. However, the tone of which this expectations will make a difference on whether they will embrace the task or put it put it up on a wall. A technique that has worked here is pair up a seasoned employee with a gener Y millennial and ask them to both learn from each other. This is where it's build relationships and respect. Totally agree, Pan. Amazing sense of reverse mentorship on there. 
Um, Terry, uh, I'm working now remotely due to the pandemic, but sometimes it does make me feel disconnected despite Zoom, et cetera. How do you have, do you have any suggestions that help with this? Oh my goodness, Terry, <laughs> don't we all feel uh, disconnected? I feel really disconnected too. I, um, for my team, gosh, you know, I mean, there's a lot of sides to feeling disconnected. There's also the relationships you have with your friends, your family, making sure you go outside, getting sun on there, making sure you're still staying physical with your body because those can also add feelings of, you know, depression and disconnect. Um, if it's in terms of the workplace on there, sometimes have happy hours. Like literally Zoom happy hours when you talk about nothing specific on there. I I know a lot of people who have done something similar on that, and it's just a way of um, chatting that, like creating that water cooler talk that would normally exist in person, but in a virtual environment. Um, I would totally suggest doing that on there. Awesome. All right. Well, that looks about it. So if you have any other questions, feel free to email me. I know you guys have a link to my website on there. And also feel free to send questions to Valerie or Jason or whoever's on staff who can answer them. I'm very available at jeffjbutler.com on there. And this is a really difficult time to help each and every person on this was able to take something tangible away to make this easier. Um, this isn't easy for anyone, especially like myself who you know talks about these things and has a remote team. It's it's very difficult, but I believe right now, strongly believe that there's a lot of great things that um, we can do in terms of improving our environment and being able to um, move forward in this difficult time. So with that said, uh, I appreciate all of your questions. And there's one last question that rolled in, I'll answer it and I'll just jump off here. Uh, this topic reaches not only our personnel, but our court defendants, virtual hearings being nationwide with the pandemic, any suggestions? I, I can't comment on this, Courtney. I mean, I my friend's a uh, close friend of mine is a police officer and he was telling me about how the virtual hearings, it's all across the board. Um, I have, I cannot comment on there because I think that's more of a lower level thing that's out of my scope. So with that said, feel free to send me questions and comments. It's great being here and I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you.